your number one source for election coverage and analysis. This is Gerard at Large. Podcaster and those of you in the surrounding towns, this is Gerard at Large, and I am still your ever humble but now caffeinated host, Rich Gerard. Thanks for tuning in. Our time is 8.04. Our station is 90.7 WLMW New Hampshire Family Radio. You can find us on the web at GerardAtLarge.com, and you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Joining us now is Rebecca Kiesling. Yeah. And we met Rebecca yesterday here on Radio Row, and she has a fascinating story. Those of you listening in the six. To, uh, 6.30 to 7 uh, segment, heard quite a row between myself and Lisa Wexler, radio show host out of Westchester County, New York. And uh, I brought this lady and her story up to uh, Lisa and was accused of throwing a cheap shot. So, <laughs> so um, Rebecca, I, I have to tell you, um, I, I took a quick look at your website. Of course, I remember the conversation. Uh, that we had yesterday. I'd like you to take a moment to introduce yourself to our uh, listeners um, so they can understand when it comes to the whole issue of uh, life, death, and abortion, why you're important to this discussion. Mm, Thanks. I was adopted and learned that I was conceived when my birth mother was abducted by a serial rapist at Knife Point. She actually went to two back alley abortionists. I was almost aborted, but the back alley conditions and the fact that it was illegal caused her to back out. And so she was forced to carry me. The law in Michigan was such that I was protected with no exceptions. And those legislators, activists, were my heroes. You know, my mother did not choose life for me, but she chose abortion. And so I really owe my life to the law being there for me. And my birth mother and I are both thankful today that we were both spared from that abortion. So you've, you've met your birth mother. We're very, very close. Um, the family I was adopted and raised in was actually abusive, and things kind of got ugly the last several years. So two years ago, on her birthday, 22 years from the day we met, My birth mother and her husband legally adopted me. So you've been adopted back by your birth mom. Yes. And for me, that's my fairy tale ending. And and you're, so what, 22 years old? Yeah, right. (laughs) Well, you already know that abortion was illegal. It was before Roe v. Wade. Actually, my birthday was exactly 10 months before the trial date in Roe v. Wade and exactly three and a half years to the date of Roe v. Wade. Wow. So, um... Now, a question that jumps to my mind, one of the things that we hear um, from people who think there should be exceptions uh, for rape and incest is that, you know, a child finding out somehow that they were the a product of, of, of a violent oh, act like that. I hate like that now. term. I hate the term product. Well, I really do. I, I, the, the people, uh, <laughs> when they find out they came from a violent act yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, is that better? Yes. Um, uh, somehow carry with them tremendous you know, guilt that causes them uh, no, no nothing good. Um, how do you feel knowing uh, about the circumstances of your conception? How has that affected your life or, or has it? Well, when I was young, I didn't really have a foundation for dealing with this difficult truth. And I now, felt, when, did you, I'm sorry, when did you find out? I was 18 when I learned I was conceived in rape, 19 when I met her and she shared the horrible details. Mm-hmm. And she was very happy to meet me, but she she was honest about everything. And I felt very much devalued. I felt targeted by society. I immediately thought about what people say in cases of rape, and especially in cases of rape. I felt like I was going to have to justify my own existence. I really thought that by meeting her, too, that that would bring value, identity to my life. That It was sort of like Alex Haley's quest you know, with the movie Roots, you know, and I was going to find my roots and this would be, bring such deep meaning. And, you know, now I can look back and it really has because I I do have a sense of purpose. My life was spared for a purpose and I'm able to minister to others, help others to process through this. On my website, I have dozens of stories of others conceived in rape, incest, and a page dedicated to stories of women pregnant by rape. And there's probably 10 times as many that I'm actually connected to that didn't write out their stories and we have a support group, and we um, are all Facebook friends together and communi- keep in touch that way. And it's sort of this really unique um, kinship. 
Short Alerts time is 8.09. We are with Rebecca Kiesling. She is an internationally known uh, advocate, speaker on the topic of, um, on the topic of life. Uh, your, your website's interested. It says, conceived in rape, targeted for abortion. Yes. Is that how you feel uh, about the issue in general, that this whole discussion about you know, women should be able to decide what they want to do with their bodies? Do you, do you believe that what we're really doing is targeting children for extermination? Absolutely. I, you know, I have that picture of an unborn child inside of gun sites, and I, I really wanted to have a disturbing image that people just understand that that's wrong, you know, that's just wrong, and, but that, that's really the picture of what it is. Um, you know, they'll talk about how much they care about women. Well, I'm a woman, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, oh, we have. <laughs> and, you know, they could care less about me. What good is my right to anything as a woman if I don't have my right to life? Um, and I, I really don't think it has anything to do with caring about women. I think it has to do with this whole sexual revolution and this agenda you know, pushing all the, I don't know, I, I don't see that they have care for women when abortion really hurt so many women. Yeah, and, and uh, go ahead, Mike. I know you have um, a question. You know, I, 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 Rebecca, I'm, I'm very glad we have the opportunity to talk to you because you are the, the mythological, uh, you, know, you know, in cases of rape or incest that we always hear about when, when you talk about the abortion issue. And, and so to have a chance to, somebody, to talk to somebody who actually uh, has some experience with that subject is, is fascinating. When you finally got a chance to meet your birth mom, um, did she talk to you uh, about the time when she, after being abducted and raped, as you said, she realized she was pregnant? That that time that she was carrying you, the thoughts that were going through her mind, obviously mm-hmm. she she was not happy because she went to try, try to have an abortion twice, you said, and, and mm-hmm. it was really the, the Michigan laws at the time that, that saved you from mm-hmm. that. But her, obviously... Uh, she was a lot, of, a lot of anger and and, uh, and and emotion involved. In that did she give you a kind of an insight into her whole thought process and how she's developed that over the years and having a chance to meet you? Mm-hmm. And by the way, she she she's uh, very fortunate that it worked out the way it did. Oh, thanks. So. Um, you know, she told me about the whole aftermath, the the whole night. She walked me through the whole evening and going back home and and everything she did. She had her. Two children, 10 and 12, were at, were at home. She had just been walking to the grocery store down the street from her home. And uh, it was horrible. I know it was. And since when we first met, I asked her about abortion. A few weeks later, after meeting in person, I got up the courage because I, I still wanted to know. And she, again, was honest. And she told me if it had been legal, she would have aborted me. And I asked her, you don't mean if you had to do it all over again, right? And she said, No. And I'm like, well, what about everything you said in that letter you sent me, you know, not reason enough of having to give up something as beautiful as you were. What about when you told me when you were sick two years ago that the only thing that kept you going was the hope that someday you'd be able to meet you wouldn't have had that? And she said, you don't know what it was like. Right. But six years later, when my niece was in an unplanned pregnancy with her first great-grandchild, I was with her when she was making baby clothes for her. And she said, you know, I'm really glad that she decided to have this baby. And... I've changed my mind about all that. And now she's very pro-life. She comes with me to hear me speak at banquets. She's been to several events with me, maybe five events. She's heard me speak. And we did the show Extra together. Glamour Magazine did our story together. And she's, she's very proud. And, um, I, you know, I'm a blessing to her. I honor her. I bring her healing. Um, and, and now, having gone to pregnancy center banquets with me, she says, you know, there were no pregnancy centers like that back then. But if there had been, I would have gone. No. She wasn't given any other option than abortion. Now, Rebecca, um, one of the, the, the tangles I had with the other talk show host was that I, as a man, could not emotionally understand what a woman faces in the decision to make an abortion or, or to have an abortion or, or not, uh, especially in these circumstances. Do, do you believe given the story that you've just shared, that it is precisely because of the emotional turmoil and hardship that many women experience as a result of an unplanned pregnancy by whatever means, but certainly by you know, rape or incest uh, circumstances. That is precisely that 
emotionalism that might require a, a cooling off period or, or mm -hmm. some way to separate the emotion from the, the potential consequences of yet another action. Mm -hmm. You know, on my website, like I said, I have stories of other women who became pregnant by rape. And I have a group video. It's actually called Accepting Cases of Rape, 12 Stories of Survival. Nine of us conceived in rape, incest, one who, uh, and then three who became pregnant by rape are all in the, this video. And I have the clip of those women. There's a montage of them. And, you know, they admitted, acknowledged that they had considered abortion because, you know, that's what they hear. And, and they saw that that was really the only assistance they were given, that, you know, Government will pay for it, even. Solve the problem. You know, and it will Medicaid funding through Hyde Amendment exceptions. The, the well, it's state a, it's would a pay. Quick, it's a quick resolution to yeah. the, the situation. And that was the only yeah. help they got. That was, And, you know, their friends, family who they did share with just gave them this as the option. And everybody just thought, well, of course. And, but they said that, um, and this is what studies show, the book Victims and Victors explain this too, that these women feel really a sense that this child was given to them for a purpose and they feel like they actually have somebody to keep them company during their time of healing. Many of them expressed that they had vowed never to tell another person about the rape and now that they were pregnant they had to face it, they had to acknowledge it and they actually because they were pregnant had to tell their parents and now got counseling where they never would have received counseling and so most will express that that child brought them healing um, overwhelmingly, the, you know, and people assume most rape victims will want an abortion. They actually choose abortion at half the rate of your average unplanned pregnancy, which is over 50% nationwide. Rape victims, depending on the study, it's between 15 to 25%. Again, the Victims and Victors books outlines all the research. And on his website, Dr. David Reardon, the Elliott Institute, um, and then the majority of rape, rape victims choose to raise her child, not the rapist baby, which is what you always hear them say. I'm not the rapist baby. You know, he doesn't even know of my existence. And what an insult to those women mm. who are raising their children to suggest that their child is the rapist baby. Well, that's, that's exactly what we heard in this discussion there. Yeah, exactly. That, you know, you're going to re-victimize the woman again mm -hmm. by making her carry the rapist no, baby. No, you know what does? That, yeah. The abortion does. The women who abort are four times more likely to die within the next year. And that is another traumatic, violent intrusion into their body. After having already been traumatized, abortion is extremely violent. Rebecca, I'm sorry. We're just flat out of time. We have other folks that we need to get to, and I know you need to move on. Will you be a guest? Would you call in and, and, and do a, a more extended interview with us at oh, some I point? I would love, to. Well, I'd love to. We'll be in touch. You can find out more about Rebecca and her story and what she does to help other women who have been uh, affected as she uh, as her mother was by going to Rebecca Kiesling, K-I-E-S-S-L-I-N-G dot com. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story. Time is 8.19. We are awaiting a call of Jane Aitken. She is calling on behalf of Rick Parent, who's running for Congress. And while we're waiting for Jane, I have to, I have to tell you, uh, I, I wish, I hope it came through the radio, but I wish that you could have seen this interview. I, I am transfixed by very few people that I interview. And um, Rebecca Kiesling... Um, I guess I would have to say I'm, I'm speechless by the experience of speaking to this woman whose conception was from tragedy, but whose life has probably spared thousands. Well, I'll tell you what, when you meet somebody like that, you really, uh, you really have a hard time feeling sorry for yourself after meeting somebody like that. that. that Anything's a happened to you shift. that fails in comparison yeah, right. to what she's been through. That's a pretty amazing story. All right, we have Jane Aitken with us. Good morning, Jane. Morning. Now, Jane, Mike corrected my uh, my, my uh, discussion of you or my introduction of you as a, as a leader in the Tea Party movement in New Hampshire. So I'll give you the opportunity to describe for yourself, for our listeners, what exactly your role in the Tea Party is and politically, uh, politically in general, uh, which, what, where your role's been. Well, uh, as you know, the Tea Party started way back in 2007 before Fox News would even cover us. And so I've been tea partying since then, and as the movement grew bigger and bigger, I decided to uh, invite all the center-right groups in New Hampshire to uh, pledge their support for the movement by joining a coalition uh, whereby we would share events and educational uh, things, 
And uh, so I really coordinate it. Um, we don't have any kind of hierarchy, as Mike said. Each person who is the leader that, uh, you know, the group leaders get together on email, but they take care of their own groups. Their own groups don't change. And uh, so we're a coalition in, in that sense, and we don't take money uh, from anyone, and we're not funded, and we don't deal with money at all. We don't uh, endorse, although some of the leaders endorse. And um, I do a lot of the work. Yes, it's true. You know, I get the e-blast out, and I take care of the mailing list. And uh, as with all organizations, some do more work than others, but we're all just leaders and individuals because I always tell people you're a committee of one, <laughs> and you have to do what you have to do, and you shouldn't wait for someone to tell you to do it. So it sticks with that philosophy. Indeed. Now, Jane, you've decided to... Uh well, I don't want to say break ranks, but you've decided to endorse Rick Parent for Congress over incumbent Frank Ginta. Tell us why. Well, um, you know, Rick uh, is for a lot of the things that I believe uh, need to be done in D.C., and um, I like Rick. He's a very intelligent, nice guy. He's a family man. Uh, Rick is 100% pro-life. Um, he's pro-Second Amendment. thought I'd just throw those two things in there. <laughs> He will help us fight things like taxing the Internet. Um, he's generally for limited government. And, um, you know, he understands a lot of the issues that we care about, that sometime, uh, you know, people go to D.C. and they get swallowed up in D.C. and they, they forget about some of these things or they make concessions. Um, you know, I think Rick will not make any concessions. Well, where do you think that um, – what, what leads you to conclude that Frank, who, who did enjoy uh, Tea Party support, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, in his campaign two years ago, where do you think he's gone wrong or he, he just doesn't get it? Well, um, I did support well, Frank. I like just think Rick would be a better advocate. I did support Frank. I like Frank very much. Um, but a lot of – I'm hearing a lot of things that uh, people don't like about some of the votes. Um, I've tried to understand why someone would have to vote for certain things. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's nothing too specific, but things to do with spending. Um, I can't think of a whole lot of things right now. <laughs> it's early in the morning, but there, are quite, there were quite a few things that people didn't like about the votes and um, where money was coming from and so on and so forth. Uh, but, you know, people just sometimes want to change. They want to change, and uh, they want to try something different. And nothing really outstandingly terrible that Frank has done. Uh, I know he did raise the debt ceiling. He voted to raise the debt ceiling. Uh, I think he did vote uh, for the bill that included the egregious clause that uh, has everybody up in arms about NDAA. Um, what is NDAA? Uh, it's a National Defense Authorization Act in, in which... It provides that the president can hold and detain anyone without cause, uh, an American citizen, which, of course, just happened with the case of Brandon Robb, who was posting song lyrics and talking the way I often talk <laughs> on Facebook. And they just came to his house one day and said, you're not arrested, but we're sending you to a psychiatric facility because we don't like your attitude against the government. Well, I hate to tell them, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, they could find a lot of people that believe the way this fellow does, and um, so people are fearful, you know, this. what's next? They're going to round us all up for our beliefs. And so, you know, the NDAA clause, uh, the clause that was in that bill, maybe there was something else in the bill, uh, which is a whole other issue, non-germane amendments and stuff like that. But you still, you have to be stick to your principles and not vote for something. If it has something so bad in it like that, let them rewrite the bill if they really think the other things are so important. Why do we have things that are snuck in there? You know, like with the health care bill, people are reading it and finding all these egregious uh, things like the IRS can get into your bank account and so on and so forth. So a lot of things like that, we need somebody to stand up and vote, be another Mr. No so to speak. Uh, as you know, Mr. No himself is leaving the Congress. He's retiring, so we need to put in a lot of Mr. No's to replace him. Dr. No's, I guess we call it. 
And specifically, uh, Jane, are there any particular issues that you believe that Rick is going to focus on that um, are going to uh, that are going to gain a better result? Uh, as as you know, I think we're all sympathetic. I can't speak for everyone in the office, but I can certainly speak for the people around this table and, and yourself. I think we all want to see a federal government that is um, uh, put in its place that uh, respects state and individual rights, that uh, is moving toward a more constitutionally functioning government. Um, I think we have to be very careful with things like the Patriot Act and CISPA and certainly this NDAA Act that, sh- that you've described as potential um, deprivers of, of our individual liberties and freedom. But, but that having been said, if Rick Parents elected to Congress, where specifically do you believe he will be different and by different, I guess I mean better than, than Frank Ginter. Is there a particular issue? Is it a mindset, an attitude? What, what are you looking for? Why has he become your choice? Well, I think he understands about the fact that we, we can't just sit around and talk about cutting little things here and there. We're in deep trouble, and we, we need to start cutting, I mean, seriously. A lot of departments, the Department of Education, I was a teacher for 35 years, but I am for cutting the Department of Ed because in my 35 years, I never saw anything the federal government did to improve local education. Um, he certainly will carry the banner on auditing the Fed and ending the Fed. Um, hopefully that could, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's a pipe dream, but we could end the IRS too. Uh, the Department of uh, the, the HUD. I mean, as you know, right now, a lot of the people in my group are leading the charge against the sustainable communities initiatives that have been um, being dangled in front of, you know, HUD is dangling money in front of the towns so that they can um, create these sustainable communities initiatives plans that are not coming from the bottom up. People haven't asked to do this, but HUD and EPA are doing it. Um, a couple of other departments, energy, uh, we have a department of energy, but yet we're not allowed to uh, drill <laughs> in certain places that would give us energy independence. So a lot of things like that, which need serious cutting, um, would probably help our budget, too. I mean, I, it's, when, I, when I look at, you know, I look at the State Department on Twitter, too. This is another thing. The United Nations, we're involved in the United Nations it seems like we're doing everything on their behalf now. Uh, they can uh, organize wars, and we have to go there and fight for for their principles and not ours. Um, if you follow the State Department on Twitter, it's mind-boggling the, the things that they're involved in. I thought the State Department was an agency that looked out for America, you know, not for the United Nations. So... This is pretty scary. That I guess social media and uh, the internet has brought us even closer to what the government is doing, and I'm just I, I continue to be appalled, even though I've been doing this a long time. I mean, just go look on the UN's website; thousands and thousands of pages of plans they have for you and me, <laughs> you know. And they're not even a government; they're just an NGO. So we need somebody to ferret out the fact that, you know, we're, we're being run by NGOs, we're being run by foreign lobbyists, uh, we're being run by banking interests. Jane, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we are flat out of time. Oh. I appreciate your joining us here this morning on Gerard at Large. We've got a very tight schedule this morning, and we have to move on. That was a fast 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That was Jane Aiken of Bedford, a, I don't know what to call her, an organizer of the Tea Party here in the state of New Hampshire. I know that's the wrong term, but she's involved, okay? She's supporting Rick Parent for Congress, and you can learn more about his campaign by going to rickparentforcongress.com. That's rickparentforcongress.com. That segment brought to us by Ken Hawkins. He's running for the state Senate in District 9, which includes Bedford, New Boston, Mount Vernon, and Lineborough in our listening area. Go to Ken Hawkins for state uh, for Senate, KenHawkinsForSenate.com to learn more about his candidacy. And details are still coming out about this alleged push polling. There are questions that have been raised not only by that interview but in subsequent conversations or I should say communications I've had on this. Well, it's time. It's 8.32. And I don't know why I'm talking Motown on that music, but uh, I am. I don't know. 
Yeah, John Lynch three time hours is, of sleep. That's why. Oh, you know, and I am, I think I am fully caffeinated, which means you know what it's going to be like in a half an hour. You yes. know, I am going to have the opportunity to interview Senator Kelly Ayotte a little later this morning as part of a Radio Row round table. If you have a question you'd like us to ask Senator Ayotte, feel free to hit our Twitter account at Gerard at Large. That's at sign Gerard at Large, at spelled out. And uh, let us know what you would like to hear from Senator Ayotte. Joining us now is Norman Herrera. He's with Chesapeake Energy, a Virginia-based company that is big in natural gas. Am I getting it wrong? Chesapeake Energy is the second largest producer of natural gas. Second larger. Based out of Oklahoma City in oh, Oklahoma. Oh, why did I have you in Virginia? You know, the, the name really uh, <laughs> sometimes strikes people as a Virginia company, but we're based in Oklahoma. Yeah, with must operations. be that Chesapeake Bay thing. That may be it. That may be it. Do you have operations in Virginia? We have operations in 17 states across the country, but not in Virginia. You're not even going to throw me a bone on this, dude, are you? <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, Norman is an expert when it comes to things like compressed natural gas. We're going to learn what that is and why um, you should know about it. So, Norman, thank you for joining us here on Radio Row, New Hampshire's only media broadcast or other out news outlet here. Good morning, team. Excited to talk about vehicles and talking about the opportunity for consumers and fleets to save money on their fuel. Uh, natural gas in transportation is a substitute to diesel and gasoline. Uh, you can power a vehicle on uh, compressed natural gas. Uh, when you do that, uh, you have such an abundance in natural gas across the country. It's produced in 32 states now we, uh, everywhere in this country. We, we, did, a, we did a story uh, you know, months ago um, on compressed natural gas in the conversion of, of the tractor-trailer fleet, the truck fleet, the diesel fleet. I guess I'll put it that way, and, and how diesel operators of, of things like long-haul trailers and whatnot – uh, are, are converting their rigs to compressed natural gas because of the tremendous savings involved. You're telling us that we should be looking to do this for passenger vehicles too? That's going to be the eventual market. Right now, uh, fleets is the primary market. So if you're a mail carrier or if you're in telecommunications, if you're a utility, if you're in sanitation or in transit, those are all the big markets for growth. Uh, today, uh, one in 20 transit buses across the country are running on natural gas. Mm -hmm. Uh, refuse trash collection is really the largest market for growth in natural gas vehicles. Uh, long haul truck carriers, if you're going coast to coast and border to border on 18 wheels, there's a solution for that in natural gas. Well, I'm thinking there's got to be some sort of a fueling infrastructure, though, to be able to accommodate a conversion. So how, how widespread is the infrastructure, and what are the practical applications of, of that infrastructure today? You can, you can find growth markets in places like California and Utah. Now, and you've used the term growth markets a couple times. Let's, let's define what a growth market is because I'm just a dumb radio host. No, gr growth market can be defined in many ways. I think uh, you have ports, and the port of Los Angeles, the port of... Uh, Long Beach. You have uh, cities where there's natural gas production. So okay. that would be uh, places like Fort Worth and Louisiana. So Ohio natural and gas, you know, as it runs through pipes in cities and towns, it's that kind of natural gas that you're talking about putting into our cars, not propane. Exactly. Exactly. It's the pipeline okay. uh, infrastructure that's there that heats homes, that um, heats stoves and furnaces. That same natural gas is the one that can use uh, be used in a vehicle uh, efficiently and uh, very environmentally friendly way. So you, you need truck stop operators, uh, companies like Loves and Pilot Flying J and uh, Petro and Travel Stops of America, who all have made announcements of investing in that, to be combined with trucking firms, companies like J.B. Hunt and Swift, uh, Schneider, uh, and... and How about uh, things like Federal Express or UPS? I mean, they get quite a fleet, no? Exactly, yeah. So, so FedEx, UPS, uh, those are all the types of fleets, AT&T and Verizon and Comcast that have all made announcements and are all moving aggressively into this marketplace. Now, um, you work for a gas company, so I, I think I can project, predict your answer. But, you know, what happens if you, you get, you know, thousands, millions of vehicles out there on compressed natural gas um, as a vehicle fuel? What happens there to the whole supply and demand equation? And shouldn't we expect prices to go up? Good question. No, uh, the United States has been blessed by being almost the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. When you see that, you have abundant supplies in 32 states. Uh, over 100 years of supply is present today with current uh, drilling and engineering um, oppor opportunities. So certainly, if, if the market went in that direction, uh, you have an ability to go back and uh, produce more natural gas from vast reservoirs in states like Louisiana and 
Ohio and Oklahoma and Texas. So that's a, a matter of, yes, the market can move in this pretty aggressively uh, and, and have the infrastructure to support it. Because now you have investment from companies like General Electric and 3M, uh, Whirlpool and Eaton. Uh, oh, that are, General Electric, that taxpayer-supported company. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, when you when you drill or drill for natural gas, when you discover natural gas, natural gas and please correct me if I'm wrong, sits on top of uh, petroleum. Is that correct? Is that sits on top of the oil? So you have to kind of siphon off the gas to get the oil out of the ground. Is that correct? Well, it's interesting. You, you've, what's made it revolutionary is you have shale formations. Okay. And shale formations are anywhere from five thousand feet to ten thousand feet below the ground. Okay. Uh, and that's what's really led to this transformation. That's why four years ago maybe we weren't talking about transportation in this market because we didn't have that stability of supply. And now you have that. Okay. Wow. So. Um, then it's not necessarily associated with oil the way we used to understand natural gas. Correct. It's, it's a domestic onshore reservoir uh, that's available there to be produced safely and reliably throughout uh, the country. So, okay, so what is the, um, uh, the path? I mean, at what point do you see, I have two questions, at what point do you see um, people being able to, to tank up, to fuel up with compressed natural gas and well, how does that process work? I mean, how do we get a, a, a gas? I know you compress it. Does that turn it into a, a liquidified form? Or will, my, will the engine in my car run on natural, compressed natural gas? And how do I put it in my tank? Sure, sure. Uh, well, you can have liquefied natural gas, and you, have, you could have compressed natural gas. Compressed natural gas traditionally has been the market for uh, fleets like an AT&T or Verizon or UPS. So you have three things on your vehicle. You have a, a fuel, fueling storage a fuel line, uh, and then an engine control module, something that modifies your computer on your engine. Uh, all those things are available today. Uh, you have over 50 manufacturers, uh, companies like Ford and Chrysler, uh, General Motors, Navistar, uh, Cummins Westport, uh, that all have those types of uh, models available today from the factory that are factory produced, uh, warrantied, uh, serviced, crash tested, brake tested, and emissions tested. Now, we, and if you crash, you're not going to like you know, go up like an old Ford Pinto, are you? No, sir. Uh, the, the, the tank itself is probably one of the most uh, structurally secure uh, parts of the vehicle once you've converted. Uh, this is so a- basically no change over what we have right now. I mean, you know, you're not, you're not worrying about running down and, you know, blowing up with a tank of gas in your car, so it's not any different with the, the CNG. Correct, yeah. You, you have um, opportunities there to have a structurally secure uh, storage location. Uh, that's uh, MS uh, engineered to be uh, safe and reliable there, that's gone through bonfire tests and crash tests and gun rage tests, uh, and, and very secure again. So the answer would be it's safe. Now, you, if, okay. if it, okay, because we're, we're uh, draw large time is 840. We're with Norman <laughs> Herrera. He's with, Chesa- he's, Chesa- he's with Chesapeake Energy, and we're learning about compressed natural gas and how we might be able to use that to uh, be, not only become more energy in, in, uh, independent, but I'm understanding that uh, it could cost us a whole lot of – it could save us a whole lot of money sure. at if, the pump. If, if you look outside, and we've had some of the disruptions there with the hurricane. Right. Uh, and, and that's something that the stability of having something produced here in the States uh, domestically that's not subject to any international markets or any weather markets or patterns uh, makes it pretty stable. When you combine that with the amount of production that we've had recently in the last four to five years, uh, and then you add the environmental improvements. And finally, the most important thing, the price point there. Today, uh, you can find natural gas in my home uh, for $1.35. And if you fuel at home, it's close to under a dollar, 91 cents. You can fuel at home? Yeah. Yes, you can. And that's Did something. I miss that? No, we were talking about that yesterday. You, you don't that's have why to he's go, on, the, oh. on the radio with us right now. <laughs> so you don't have to go to the gas station? You can rig it up and have it come right out of your house? Correct. Over 70% of the homes across the country have natural gas. Uh, I do. generated to them. Yeah. I do. Uh, so, so when you have natural gas provided in the home, uh, you, you compress it there in your garage, uh, and then you're fueling it under a so dollar. No, I can't do it. I don't have a garage. Eh, put it in the carport, whatever. I don't have that either. Hey, now, one, one question I wanted to ask you real quickly, and everybody knows you know, we have a, it's a big hairy mess to get oil out of the ground, to put it in a tanker, take it to a refinery, turn it into gasoline, take it to the gas station. It's a big mess. How does the drawing the natural gas out of the ground and how quickly do you have to do you have to refine it also, or you just compress it and boom, it goes right in the car. The, the latter. It's one of the most okay. efficient weld to wheels benefits so there is. So we can literally 
get out of the ground one day and be driving on it within the week or so, right? Yeah, the local utility company in your market would be the one that has already had the gas to retail quality. And that retail quality, the same one that's going into your home or going to your business, going to an industrial use or a commercial use, is the one you would use to fuel your vehicle. Nice. So it's so we could, you know, because I know we, we have real problems with, like right now, like you just pointed out, the hurricane going through Louisiana. That's where our main, one of our main refineries are. And we've already heard the news report yesterday, expect a spike in gas price, gasoline prices, at least a temporary short-term spike over the next uh, week to two weeks because they're going to, they had to shut down all the rigs and all that stuff. Yeah, no, our, our country has millions on millions of natural gas pipelines throughout it. You know, it's the most safe uh, way to transport a fuel more so than on the road uh, because we have that advantage that other countries do not have of pipeline in the ground. That same pipeline is the one that's going to be able to service these stations. Gerard, large time is 843. This segment's being brought to us by Representative John Burt. He's in Goffstown running for re-election. Give uh, him a look at BurtNH.com. That's B-U-R-T-N-H.com. Earlier today, Speaker O'Brien you know, was enthusiastic in his support for Representative Burt's re-election bid, asking voters in Goffstown to send him back. We hope you'll take a look at BurtNH.com to find out why. Norman, as we uh, close out this segment, I have uh, uh, a final question for you. Um, to convert an existing vehicle to be able to operate on compressed natural gas, I'm assuming comes at a cost, or to purchase a new vehicle that is equipped to burn compressed natural gas. Um, there's got to be a cost differential, I would think, between what it would cost you to buy a normal car and this one. And then I'm thinking there's got to be some kind of expense to uh, develop the, the, uh, the portal at my home through which I can fill my car. Talk to me about the dollars and cents of, of these conversion processes so people really get a feel for the economics of it. Sure. Uh, well, today, uh, the primary market are those vehicles that run a lot of miles, and they can take advantage of a dollar fifty savings to $2 savings. So um, in the past, with economies of scale, you've seen that number go down and down. So if you're Ford or if you're Kenworth or Peterbilt uh, or, or Swift or a company like that that's moving in that direction, what you're doing is uh, you're saving because of your fuel costs. If you're driving 20,000 miles a year and you're saving a dollar fifty at the pump, then an incremental cost of $10,000 to $12,000 can be paid off in two to three years. And that's really what makes it pretty advantageous to fleets. Now, what happens if uh, gasoline prices come back down? You know, we, we have a change in administration, and we get serious about developing the resources that we have here in this country. And gas prices, just remember, when Barack Obama was nominated, gas was only $1.89 a gallon. Now, what happens if gas goes down to $1.89 a gallon? What does that do to the, the movement to convert uh, fleets to compress natural gas. I, I got to think that's got to hurt. Well, sure. No, you have the variability that's always going to take place. And that variability is something that you have now with a, a pretty succinct and su supply specific resource there. That supplier that you have today in abundance uh, can give confidence to a fleet manager or to a fleet purchaser uh, to have fuel that's reliably priced for a long period of time. Well, one of the things I like about it is where it comes from. This comes from our own backyard, not from often hostile areas of the world where people don't really like us too much and they know we're addicted to their oil and they can use our addiction to uh, affect us politically. And, you know, I mean, let's face it, we are involved in other parts of the world in conflicts, particularly because we're addicted to their oil. Um, and we can, we can get, you know, like you, like you said before, we're the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. This is, it's all right here in North America. You're right. You're right. You know, it's just a matter of uh, putting together the pieces. As we talked about this morning, you, you combine the fleets with the convenience store and truck stops. And when you do that, you have this domestic resource that's then not subject to any uh, worldwide socioeconomic uh, tr troubles and travails. Uh, and then uh, you add the environmental benefits to the fuel uh, and the combination of companies that are very invested and very engineering specific, then the market starts coming to be a reality. And That's we've seen awesome. it throughout awesome. the country. Today. I, I would like to continue this discussion, folks, but we are two minutes over time. And so I have to say thank you for being here. If people want to learn more about this compressed natural gas thing, how best can they do it? There's a website, cngnow.com, and that information there can find uh, things on fleets, on uh, fueling, and on pricing. cngnow.com. cngnow.com. Norman cool. Herrera of Chesapeake, um, natural gas. Thank you for joining us here this morning on Gerard at Large. Thank you. Pleasure right. to be with you. That Thanks. segment was brought to us by 
Chuck Rolacek. He is running for the Executive Council in District 4, which includes Manchester and just about all of the contiguous towns, plus a few more, 19 in all. Get the details on the district, what an Executive Councilor does, and why he believes, Chuck Rolacek that is, his 35 years in business experience and newcomer status to politics will give him a uh, will, will, will help him be an effective executive counselor Jordan at large time is 8.49. As advertised, well, not as advertised, we had advertised that uh, Christine O'Donnell, former 2010 Senate candidate in Delaware, now a candidate for Congress in that state, uh, was supposed to be our guest. It does her not, broom broke down. Her, br- her broom broke it's down. witchcraft thing, man. Oh, yes. Well, Will maybe, maybe Chelsea head, knows man. where he is. Chelsea, have you seen Christine O'Donnell around here? Have you seen Christine O'Donnell around here? I you have not. She's supposed to be our guest this morning. Oh, well. Hey, Rich. From. We've, All right. Hey, Rich. We've, somebody even better. Yeah, David. I wonder if Christine O'Donnell's got a gas-powered broom or if it's uh, natural gas-powered. Harry Potter, yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, is that Bob Shaw's, the, you know, a former mayor, deceased mayor, Bob Shaw's gas station on Webster Street, you know, where you could eat an Italian sub there and get gas. I remember that. It's one and the same. But since we don't have Christine O'Donnell, I'd like to introduce you to a person that we've met here. He is an internet radio broadcaster. I guess an internet broadcaster, and his name is Willie Lawson, and he's the host of the Willie Lawson Show, and his is the kind of voice that you don't often hear in the lamestream media, as we like to call them. <laughs> um, he's, he's, a, uh, he's a black man with a conservative political point of view. Willie, thanks for joining us here on Gerard at Large. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. I appreciate it, man. It's been, it's been, it's been an uh, outrageous few days. Um, <laughs> and, and what's the exciting part is, man, that I am not a unicorn. Uh, we <laughs> actually, actually exist. <laughs> we ex- actually exist. And, 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 and if you're listening to the show, go ahead and hit the recorder. That way you you can play this for your grandchildren. That's right. Well, uh, now, <laughs> you know, I hate to get it. I, I personally get frustrated when I hear people talk about what Republicans need to do to win over Hispanic voters. And they have to moderate their their stance on immigration. What Republicans need to do to talk to black voters. What Republicans, need, you know, I kind of am one of these, maybe I'm a caveman. You know, maybe I'm like that, that uh, auto insurance commercial. You know, move the rock and come up for some daylight. But, but tell me, Willie, where does the Republican Party um, need to, how does it need to change? I'm assuming it, what it needs to do is change its message. I got to believe that what, why do why does the Republican Party have such a, uh, a difficult time with the black vote? They have a difficult difficult time with the black vote because they don't go to black neighborhoods and and say the very same things they say in white neighborhoods. Um, it's a lot less complicated than than the um, the political strategists believe it is. The fact of the matter is that that in a lot of black neighborhoods that are traditionally Democrats, um, the the Republican Party fails because they don't go. So they don't, don't get an op- they don't they don't ask they don't come they don't show up they I mean they show up at the black churches every four years hoping to get a vote and sometimes they don't even do that the idea is that if you're in those communities all the time uh, and preaching things like I don't know self reliance you know entrepreneurship yeah that works in the black communities well, too and and if you do that that makes a difference you don't have to change the message because the message works the medicine works. Medicine works in all our bodies. All you have to do is administer If you don't hear it, yeah, it doesn't but, do any well, good. But yeah. here's the question that I have for you. I mean, it wasn't always the case that 90-plus percent of the black vote went to the Democratic candidate, and that really started to change in the 60s, especially mm-hmm. with the advent of the, the Great Society. And, and unfortunately, you know, black America is in a, in a state where nearly three-quarters of all of the children born are born to single mothers out of wedlock. Mm-hmm. I, mean, we, I don't want to go through it. We all know the state... Uh, of a uh, of disarray that the black community, the black families, in how do you how do you preach a, a gospel of self reliance to a community that is overwhelmingly dependent on one day at a time, the government, one day at a time, and, and and you can't look at your circumstances. Yes, right now things aren't good, and and there is no quick fix. There's no magic bullet. There's no you know secret pill, no super, super secret energy pill that you can pull out of your underdog you know ring that's going <laughs> to fix all these things in an election cycle. 
No. Right. So that's why you have to go every day. You have to go every week. You have to immerse yourself in the community. There's no such thing as outreach. I think that outreach is something that, that people have used for a long time, and it's, and it's a concept that doesn't work. It obviously doesn't work. I think immersion is what you have to do. So you have to end up in that community all the time. You've got to be in that community all the time. You've got to be there for those book bag giveaways. You've got to be there for those health fairs. You've got to just be in the community. And you know what? It takes a long time. It's heavy lifting, but you've got to do it. You can't just you send care. a missionary out there once every four years. Exactly. And now, yell, or yell why, about what you want to do. Why are uh, prominent black conservatives, why are the, the, the Condies, um, you know, the, the uh, J.C. Watts, the Herman Cain's, the uh, people, the Kim Blackwells, why are they excoriated within the broader black community as sellouts to their race or Uncle Tom's or w- why? Well, because, you know, what people like um, like Jackson and Sharpton who have who basically have made their living on pimping out poor black people. Did I say that out loud? I yeah, did. Oh, man. Right. That internal monologue thing that's is just good. not working this that's early. That's what makes you fun. <laughs> just not working this early. <laughs> you know what? And, and, and I'm sorry. And he, he, here's a story that I'm going to break for you New Hampshire folks. A lot of black pastors in those churches, they're in on the game too. And that's the scariest really? thing ever. Well, they're, they in on the, they're, on, they're on money. They're in on the game too. Money, influence, access. Just like everybody else. So, so you know what? It, it, is, it behooves them to shoot down anybody who comes in and says, oh, no, 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 you don't have to be, you don't have to be in change. Thank you, Joe Biden. You don't have to stay here in this place. It behooves them to shoot them down. So that's a game, a little secret that nobody wants to tell. Willie, you've got something to say, and uh, hopefully you and I will maintain contact after this convention is done. We are we out of time, and uh, we look forward to making your voice heard in the ears of our listeners. We appreciate that, man. All right, it's Willie Lawson of the Willie Lawson Show. Tell, tell our folks how they can find your show you, on you the You can web. find my show at www.willielawsonshow.com. That's www.willielawsonshow.com. It's the easiest way. He's done that once or twice. There you go. <laughs> We are wrapping up our final day on Radio Row and headed back to scenic Pennardville today so we can broadcast live on our regular schedule tomorrow. We will be joined, although not quite so regular, tomorrow we will, of course, have Date Night Done Right and Al Caprillion, but Ron Poirier from All About Autos and Jeff Zarnick, our safety czar, will be with us. We'll have lots of questions for them. Maybe we'll talk to them about compressed natural gas and Oh, my God, did you see? I think we have like three divisions of the United States Armed Forces guarding Tampa today. Everybody from the Border Patrol to the Hillsborough Shire. Now, it turns out, folks, that we were not only the only radio broadcast here on Radio Row from the state of New Hampshire, Maine, or Vermont, but it turns out that we were the only news show, news outlet, news outlet, TV, radio, or newspaper here from the entire state of New Hampshire. We would not have been able to do this without the support of our sponsors, and we ask only that you take the time to go to their websites, learn more about them as our as your way of saying thank you to them for enabling us to be on the air. They're Ken Hawkins. He's running for the state Senate in District 9. That's Hawkins, KenHawkinsForSenate.com. Ovid LaMontagne, he needs no introduction. He's running for governor, Ovid2012.com. Rick Parent for Congress.com. He's taking on Frank Ginta in the Republican primary this September 11th. Chuck Rolacek, he's involved with a, in a primary also on September 11th. He's running for the Executive Council. Check Rolacek, R-O-L-E-C-E-K-N-H, Chuck Rolacek, N-H.com. And also a special thanks to Representatives John Burt, John Heichel, and Mark Warden in Goffstown. MarkWarden.com, HeichelForRep.com, and BurtNH.com. Without them, we would not be here. You want proof of that? We worked really hard to enlist sponsorships for the Democrat National Convention, which takes place next week in Charlotte, and we were unable to secure the necessary support. Therefore, we will make fun of them for the entire time they're doing their convention because they didn't think our being there was worthy of their effort, apparently. Well, we'd do that even if we were there. What's that? We'd be doing that even if we were there, Rich. Well, no, because I really believe that people have, should have the opportunity to get their message out there, and that's what we do here on Gerard at Large. We'll be continuing to work on the stories that broke this week while we were here, and uh, we'll be back in the saddle tomorrow from 6 to 9 as we are back in scenic Pennardville for the entire time here. Special thanks, too, by the way, to Dave, Steve, and Mike. The effort that these gentlemen had to put forward, I just have to show up and talk, but the effort that these folks put forward on behalf of the show to bring you the program and that we brought is truly extraordinary. I want to publicly thank them and express my appreciation. Couldn't do it without you guys. 